Yeah, thank you, Jenda. <laughs> now, traditional rulers uh, like me um, find themselves in a very difficult position. On the one hand, uh, politicians are very happy for you to go and fight fires, okay, uh, tell people to keep the peace, uh, preach to people, um, condemn violence. On the other, you're not allowed to criticize root causes that may come from the failings of politicians. So it's fine to say um, to a rural villager, you should send your daughter to school. But it's not fine to say to the governor, why haven't you built a school? Okay, it's fine to um, talk about um, the extreme uh, nature of, say, certain interpretations of Islam, but it's not fine to talk about how certain people have been marginalized uh, by the creation of a rentier state that basically expropriates resources and does not care about them. Um, if you take Nigeria, in 1960, land per rural, hec uh, per rural dweller was two hectares <clears throat> per rural dweller. Today we've got 0 0.9. Agricultural policy uh, still remains far behind. Productivity is much lower than the rest of the world. You don't have food security. You've got millions of children out of school. It's not the fault of the children that they're out of school. Somebody was supposed to build those schools. Um, so uh, the difficulty for traditional institutions is, on the one hand, they're firefighters, and, and we'll continue to do that. On the other, um, to actually address the root causes of extremism, you've got to address questions of governance, education, um, health care, corruption. And to do that is now political. And, and, and so that, that, that's the uh, difficulty, I think. If you take the UNDP OHDI poverty index in 2015, um, poverty levels in Nigeria, 46%. And 46% doesn't look too bad compared to other countries. <coughs> However, if you break these numbers down, in the southwest of Nigeria, 80% are living above the poverty line. In the northwest, 80% are living below the poverty line. And suddenly, it becomes two different countries. Okay, you, and now, and even those numbers don't tell you anything. As governor of Central Bank, I looked at numbers that said people are living on less than $2 a day. And it sounds bad. But you don't really know how bad it is until you look into the eyes of a woman whose baby has just died because she cannot afford drugs worth $5. Then you know what living on less than $2 a day means. You look at demographic numbers and demographic explosion, and you don't understand where they're coming from until you come to a society where a poor man who earns nothing has decided to marry four wives and have 25 children. I cannot take care of them. And, and you, you see a complete failure of social policy. I mean, who is talking about marriage? Who is talking about family structure? Who is talking about child spacing? Who is talking about the ability to maintain the children that you bring? And when we go into crowd resources as states, so you have state governors in the north who have three million, five million children on the streets without school and if you are seen as normal in the sense that you continue to do what your predecessors have been doing doing the same thing which has been normalized then there's something wrong with you you are part of the problem the real change in the north will come from the mavericks those who are considered mad people because you look around and you have to say, if this is the way we have been doing things, and this is where we have ended up, maybe we need to do things differently. If we have populated the government with middle-aged men, maybe we need to try younger people. Maybe we need to try women. If we have spent our time and our money on physical infrastructure, maybe we need to invest more in the education of our children. Maybe we need to invest more in nutrition. Maybe we need to invest more in primary health care. And the truth is, if you look at what Nasser is doing in Kaduna with 40% of his budget in education, that is the only thing that is going to save the North. And I know that when we say these things, they don't go down well. 
We've been saying this for 20, 30 years. If the North does not change, the North will destroy itself. The country is moving on. Quota system that everybody talks about must have a sunset clause. Poverty can lead to disbelief. These children that we see as almajiris and we laugh at them and we treat them as victims, somebody will just come and pick them up, put them in a school, give them medical care, and convert them to another religion. And they will do that by the hundreds and the thousands. So, what we see on the street is a product of bad economic policies and wrong priorities. These children are not criminals, they are victims. What part of Islamic law what verse in the Quran, what hadith of the Prophet allows a father to give birth to a child and leave the child to go and fend for himself? Where? Sheikh Abdullah bin Fodi said, for you to send a child out to study the Quran without the means to sustain himself, and allow that child to go around begging is desecrating and devaluing the Quran. Where did we get this idea that because you claim to be studying the Quran, you can go and just be begging around and not learning? Then how can we reduce the distance? And there are things we've got to look at, and I like the idea of IET because I have been saying in the last two, three years that we have to look at the distances that have been created between our children and education. And there are three key distances we must look at. One distance is language. Today in Nigeria, if you do not read and write in English, you are an illiterate. You can study Arabic. You can be fluent in Arabic. You can read and write Hausa. They will call you illiterate if it's Ajami. The British ruled us for 46 years. We have been independent for 60 years and we have remained in that colonial mindset. Why is it that a child who is able to read the Quran from Bakara to Nas is considered an illiterate and the system has no place for him? We must ask those questions. Why can't the educational curriculum be expanded to accommodate other languages? Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, Arabic. You can teach English as a language, but what is so special about English? That for you to study, it is so bad that if you want to do BA Hausa, if you don't have credit in English, you will not get admission into the university. I mean, how, much, how sensible is that? You, you, want, you want a degree in agriculture, you want to study animal husbandry. You can't learn in Hausa, you can't learn in Yoruba, you can't learn in Arabic. It has to be in English. Do you speak English to the cattle? Okay. I mean, how can, you be, how can you be a medical doctor studying in German and in French and in Czech and in Mandarin and in Swahili, but you can't be a medical doctor studying in, uh, and you can be a medical doctor studying in Arabic if you're in Egypt or the Sudan, but you can't be a medical doctor studying Arabic in Nigeria. So one of the things we've got to do is look at how we 
have a curriculum that allows for the mainstreaming of people who had an education, but not in the English language, but who are intelligent people, educated people. And I've done this before. I stop when children stop on the road, and I'm going to a village, and there will be an Islamia section and a primary section. And I go to the Islamia section, and I'm surprised. I see a very young girl. She knows what is ism, fi'l, harf, fi'l al-madi, fi'l mudari. I speak to the child in the primary section. They cannot answer, how old are you? And yet, this child that gets high quality education in Arabic has no value in the system. Whereas this one that spent six years in a primary school and cannot read and write seems to have a higher value. There is something wrong with that system. And it cannot, this is the first distance. The second distance is technology. We're in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. In northern Nigeria, so many people are holding phones. So many people are holding smartphones. The latest iPhones. You ask them, what do you do with your phone? They send text messages, WhatsApp, take pictures. But the telephone in your hand is infrastructure through which you can deliver education. You can learn how to code. You can learn science. You can deliver education to a child in a village using the telephone in his hand. You don't have to wait and build brick and mortar. So if we really want to address these problems, we've got to think, how do you use technology to reduce the cost? And I'm glad that a state like Kaduna, a state like Ekiti, have started looking at coding for primary school children. This is what Kenya is doing. And, and, and these, are things that, these are things that I think IET also needs to look at, because Again, I've seen the schools, we just have to continue building that. It's not just about, we, we all have to learn the Quran and the Hadith and Fiqh, but we also have to live in this world. So these are distances that I think we have created, that I think we can leapfrog. Now the final thing is da'wah itself and its relation to civil society. And I think, um, Noor made the point, we can't continue criticizing, we have to work, um, do things yourselves, and that's true. But the reality is, for the Muslim community, if we do not criticize ourselves, if we do not look at ourselves in the eyes and say, we should be better than this, we don't do ourselves justice. That is the truth. Northern Nigeria is better than this. We should, be, we, should be, we should not be the poverty capital of the world. We are better than this. And, and for me, one of the reasons that we are where we are is that Da'awa has failed to focus on these issues. Because Da'awa is first and foremost Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahyan al Munkar. And once you stop criticizing, once you stop saying this is wrong, the entire society is destroyed. Ibn al-Qayyim was doing analysis of certain verses in Surah Al-A'raf. Was'alhum anil qaryati allati kanat hadhirat al-bahri idh ya'aduna fi sabt idh ta'atihim hitanuhum shurra'an wa yawma sabt la ta'atihim kathalika balawnahum bima kanu yafsukun. Those verses of that village that was prohibited from fishing on Saturday. And what happened was that fish would come on Saturday and some people decided that they were going to fish on that day. One group told them, don't do it. Allah says you should not do it. But another group said, 
لما تشئذون قوما الله مهلكهم ام اذم عذابا شديدا why are you wasting your time talking to them don't bother at the end of the day when allah visited his pestilence only those who said stop were saved those who fished and those who watched them do the evil and said nothing were all destroyed and this is what happens to a society the silence of the duat the silence of ulama the silence of intellectuals the silence of the press when they should speak is what destroys a community and what has destroyed northern nigeria is silence da'wa must open the mouth of people to speak the truth we had a more general definition of non-interest banking and i refer you to appendix h this is the guideline that we issued in june in that guideline if you go to the bottom of page 3 we defined a non-interest financial institution as a bank or other financial institution under the purview of the central bank of nigeria which transacts business engages in trading investment and commercial activities as well as the provision of products and services in accordance with any established non-interest banking principles now we then recognized that islamic banks are one form of non-interest banks they are non-interest banks that in addition to not taking interest don't do alcohol don't do piggery don't do gambling don't do speculation but if there are other people who want a profit and loss bank that will lend to breweries they can lend it lend to it it's just not an islamic bank it's another form of non-interest bank the second criticism was that the documents that were issued before kept mentioning the word sharia i think somebody said sharia was mentioned 35 times in the document and i felt sharia is just an arabic word it's an english language document remove it and put islamic commercial jurisprudence and if there's a sharia advisory council because the islamic bank of britain has a sharia advisory council every islamic bank has a sharia advisory council but if it is a sensitive word we called it advisory council of experts now i had a lot of flack from muslims i had somebody who came to me and said that i removed sharia from the document it's no longer islamic banking and i told him that in the entire quran sharia is mentioned only once so mentioning 35 35 times in a document or removing it has no bearing on whether it's islamic banking so we removed it the third concern was that people did not understand even though we kept saying it people did not understand that these banks are non-face biased that these products are available to muslims and christians and they are not restricted to muslims and in fact i do know that in many countries if you go to malaysia the majority of the people who <coughs> patronize islamic banks tend to be even non-muslims they're the chinese businessmen jais itself has at least 60 christian shareholders the second largest shareholder in jais is a christian from iboland the point i'm making is i mean so we said okay look if people we cannot leave it to to just assumption that this is non-discrimination so if you go to the guidelines we issued on page 13 and these guidelines are on our website you can just go to our website and print them 16.2 discrimination on grounds of faith or ethnicity or any other grounds in the participation by individuals or institutions as promoters shareholders depositors employees customers 
or other relevant parties in any transaction regarding a non-interest financial institution, whether based on Islamic or other model, is strictly prohibited. The central bank, by law, is obliged to issue guidelines for how they will operate. The way we issue guidelines for commercial banking and merchant banking and mortgage banking and microfinance banking and discount houses, we cannot license an institution without issuing guidelines. The central bank is not setting up an Islamic bank. The central bank is not advertising Islamic banking. Which is why we have been accused of not communicating enough. But I have told communications people that we must make a distinction between explaining our role as a regulator and being a marketer for a product. It is for Jais to talk about the benefits of Islamic banking. It's not for the central bank. We can talk about it for financial inclusion and so on, but it is for the promoters of the bank to advertise their product. While the central bank has been regulating Islamic banking, I don't know if the House is aware that the Securities and Exchange Commission in January this year had issued guidelines for Islamic funds and that in fact you have Lotus Capital which is an Islamic fund and you have ARM and Standard Bank that have set up funds in line with the set guidelines on Islamic funds. I also don't know if members are aware that the NDIC has issued guidelines to the market for Islamic insurance for deposits. I also don't know if members are aware that at least three insurance companies in Nigeria for almost 10 years have been offering Islamic insurance or Takafu. African Alliance has been offering, Cornerstone and another. I don't know if we are aware that the federal government of Nigeria under General Obasanjo actually increased our membership of Islamic Development Bank to full member and that the Minister of Finance is, has a representative as an executive director in the Islamic Development Bank. And out of the 10, out of the 10 biggest companies that have borrowed from the Islamic Development Bank since its inception, only one is owned by a Muslim. Nine, I have a list of the Nigerian companies that have brought Islamic Development Bank. Only one is a Muslim out of the top ten. The only state that has borrowed from the Islamic Development Bank, I'm sorry Mr. Speaker, is Anambra State. <laughs> I know we laugh about this, but it is something that as Nigerians we have to learn. I mean, Anambra State just saw that this is a product, looked at the benefit and went and applied and they benefited from it. The misrepresentations have been so many. You know, people talk about me having studied Islamic law. They don't talk about the fact that at the age of eight, my parents took me to a boarding Catholic school and that I went to St. Anne's in Kaduna. And every day I said, Our Father and Hail Mary. They don't, they don't talk about the fact that when I went to King's College, I had the choice of taking Islamic religious knowledge and Bible knowledge. I studied Bible knowledge and got a distinction. And you can ask my mate in case. I have never known anything called tribalism. I have seen a very senior Christian cleric in a church accuse me of removing Christians from decision-making positions in the central bank. I became governor in 2009. The term of the board of directors of the central bank expired. I recommended a board 
for reappointment to President Er Adua. On the board of the Central Bank, we have 11 members, only three are Muslim. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank was not constituted when I became governor. The Committee of Governors took the decision. I constituted it. I recommended seven external members of the NPC. Only one is a Muslim. A deputy governor seat became open when I was governor. Dr. Kingsley Mogalu was in Geneva. I went, convinced him to come back to Nigeria and convinced the president to appoint him. On our five member COG, only three. Three are Christians, two are Muslims. We have 24 departmental directors in the central bank that I appointed. Only eight are Muslim. I never even thought of counting religion until I read that sermon. It was never a consideration. And these are the people who take these decisions. The director of financial policy and regulation who signed the guidelines and issued the guidelines and developed the guidelines, his name is Christian Chuku. The government of Japan is raising money through Islamic Sukuk. The government of the United States has raised money through Islamic Sukuk. At a time when the capital markets have dried up, the government of Malaysia two weeks ago issued a Sukuk trying to raise $2 billion. In six days, they had $9 billion because there's so much money in the Middle East going to those products. The ICRC in Nigeria is working with the central bank and the DMO to develop products. We want to advise the finance minister to go and tap into those markets in Asia and bring in four or five billion dollars to finance infrastructure in the country. So in terms of being a financial product that opens up the economy, good for financial inclusion, for diversifying funding base, that is the discussion we should be having. It's not about Islamization. The central bank is not a religious institution. It's a Nigerian institution. And you've seen Governor Charles Soludo was a Christian and a Catholic. But he did more to promote and establish guidelines for regulating Islamic banking than any governor before him. And all I'm doing is completing the work. Now I think as leaders, we need on the one hand to be very sensitive to people, which means we need to explain as much as possible and clarify the position, and I will continue to explain. I will continue to clarify. But we cannot continue to apologize for doing our work. And we cannot continue with this conversation at that level, but continue raising it to a higher level, because we want to get to a point where Nigerians are now saying, is it good for Nigeria or bad for Nigeria? Forget the sentiment. So I thought I would explain this. The law is there from 1991. The process had been ongoing before I became governor. We have tried to put finishing touches to it. And for all we are concerned as central bank, we are simply carrying out our responsibility of making sure that people do not open up a bank and take people's deposits and then have those deposits go down the drain. We have to regulate and license and supervise the institution. I do hope that I have addressed many of the issues, including some that have been tangential to it. Um, I do hope because I have the highest, like I said, I went to a Catholic school. The reason I have not come out to reply to bishops or to reply to cans is because I have to continue respecting religious authorities. I have indicated to them privately I am willing to meet any of them. I have actually asked to be invited to the Catholic Bishops Council in July. I'm willing to go to Cannes. I'm willing to go to any church. I'm willing to go to explain to anyone who wants to understand what we are doing and why we are doing. But I don't want this to be a religious conversation. I don't want it to be an emotional conversation. 
I want to be discussing about finance, about economics, about regulation, about financial inclusion, because I'm the governor of a central bank. <laughs> One we talk about birthdays and talk about happiness. I remember a few weeks ago someone asked me, Are you happy? And I said, I hope not. And he was surprised. The truth is, nobody who is a leader in northern Nigeria today can afford to be happy. You can't be happy with 87% of the poverty in Nigeria being in the north. You can't be happy with millions of northern children out of school. You can't be happy with nine states in the north contributing almost 50% of the entire malnutrition burden in the country. You can't be happy with the drug problem. You can't be happy with the Boko Haram problem. You can't be happy with political thuggery. You can't be happy with all the issues, the Almajiri problem that we have. So when we wish Nasir a happy birthday, we do not want him to be happy as a leader. Because you are happy when you think you have reached a state of delivering and taking your people to where you want them to go. Now because of the condition of Northern Nigeria, It is almost cliche now to say, if you are seen as normal, if you are a governor in the north, or a leader in the north, and if you are seen as normal, in the sense that you continue to do what your predecessors have been doing, do the same thing which has been normalized, then there is something wrong with you, you are part of the problem. The real change in the North will come from the mavericks, those who are considered mad people, because you look around and you have to say, if this is the way we have been doing things, and this is where we have ended up, maybe we need to do things differently. If we have populated the government with middle-aged men, maybe we need to try younger people. Maybe we need to try women. If we have spent our time and our money on physical infrastructure, maybe we need to invest more in the education of our children. Maybe we need to invest more in nutrition. Maybe we need to invest more in primary health care. And the truth is, if you look at what NASA is doing in Kaduna with 40% of its budget in education, that is the only thing that is going to save the North. And I know that 
when we say these things, they don't go down well. We've been saying this for 20, 30 years. If the North does not change, the North will destroy itself. The country is moving on. Quota system that everybody talks about must have a sunset clause. The reason people like NASA stand up and they are nationalists is that you don't have any sense of inadequacy. You don't need to write on being from Kaduna State or being from the North or being a Muslim to get a job. You go with your credentials, you go with your competence, you can compete with any Nigerian from anywhere. We need to get our northern youth to a point where they don't need to rely on being from a part of the country to get a job. And believe me, if we don't listen, there will be a day when there will be a constitutional amendment that addresses this issue of quota system and federal character. The rest of the country cannot be investing, educating its children, producing graduates, and then they watch us, they can't get jobs because they come from the wrong state, when we have not invested in the education of our own children. So as we celebrate Nassau at 60, we need to celebrate him as a public officer who is addressing the core problems of his constituency. It is education. It's girl-child education. It's women's rights. It's child begging, parental irresponsibility, demographic growth. It's managing a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society and bringing them into one community where they are all citizens. And it's and he's done a lot that we can learn from. So I am proud um, to count Nasser as one of my friends. I usually say that I have to keep him as a friend because he's the only person in Nigeria beside whom I am, I am considered a moderate. You know, people usually usually go to people and say, talk to your friend, um, Samusi, or talk to your friend, the Amia. But people come to me and say, please talk to your friend, Nasser. <laughs> Even two days ago, someone sent me to him with two messages. I delivered the first one, which I thought was nice and friendly and conciliatory. When I saw the reaction, I did not deliver the second one. <laughs> I'm waiting for the right time to deliver it. I should not deliver that message. But you know, we just said about how much he's invested in his own development. He's not just a political surveyor, he's a lawyer, he's got master's degrees, he's had over 80 certificates from Harvard. And education is what makes the man. And one thing I can say when I, you know, I was telling someone who drove into this government house and we talked about how beautiful it was. I said, let me tell you something. If you take Nasser out of this government house today and put him in a two bedroom apartment, if he has light and his books, one night it will not matter to him. There's no difference. And, and it's important that we realize that what we have, the positions that we hold, are transient. And they do not define us. Anybody can be called a governor. Anybody can be called an mayor. Anybody can be called a commissioner, a minister. At the end of the day, you owe it to yourself for the years that you are given that opportunity to know that God has given you a chance to do something, to leave a mark and to impact people's lives. 
Now, those people today may not appreciate it, including the people you are helping. There's a story of Chief Obafe Miawolo when he started free, uh, free primary education. They demonstrated against it. The women came out naked. The fathers refused to pay taxes. You had to force them. All those people whose parents were complaining today are thankful they are professors, they are doctors, they are engineers. What we say about Nasiru today will not matter. Some of us will say things because we are his friends. Some of us will say things because maybe we want favors from him. What will really matter is long after he's gone, when the history of Kaduna State is being taught in a classroom to children whom he has never met, what will they say about him and what he did? And that is what is true of each and every one of us. You have to think not how the people around us, living with us, react to us. Each of us has to think in the next 50 years, 100 years when I am gone, when the history of this office is being written, what would it be said that I did? That is the most important thing, the legacy. So, I pray for you that what you are building today remains a legacy that will be remembered after you. And my prayer for you is that you will impact the lives of people who you do not know, whom you have never met, in a manner that they will remember you forever. Um, of course, um, NASA takes many risks. Um, people have said you can't say what someone is perfect. I said he has most of the qualities. There are two that I would like him to learn more of. One quality is diplomacy. I know it sounds uh, rich coming from me, but, <laughs> but, but I can actually advise Nasser on being diplomatic today. That is a good thing. He's the one person I can advise on being more diplomatic. The other is more patience with people. Because as we grow older, we realize that not everybody will be at our level. That sometimes what we see with clarity, it takes others a long time to see. And maybe there's, it's not malice, maybe it's not bad intention, it's just that they can't see it. And so sometimes we need to slow down. A final story of, uh, like I said, it takes risks, and he needs to take, to take risks. When he had a problem with teachers in Kaduna State, some of his political friends came to me and said, advise your friend, he's on his first time. He should not take this risk, he can lose the election. So I said, okay, I will advise him, but I know you will not listen to this advice. I mean, I wasn't surprised, I knew what his answer would be, but I came to him. I said, Nassim, some people think you should wait until you get your second term. He said, Your Highness, if the people of Kaduna State want to vote me out because I want good education for their children, let them vote me out. You know, and that is really the attitude. People, you, you win an election, after you win, you should be governing for the people. You should not have, you should not be in a campaign mode for four years. You were elected to deliver a service, deliver the service. If people appreciate it and vote for you, fine. If they don't, you have done your bit. The biggest risk he has taken, which I saw today, which I will be very careful about taking, is to have a documentary and have your wife talk about you. I will be very careful about this. Uh, I don't know if you saw this documentary. Uh, but certainly, if anybody offered to interview my wife, I will make sure I edited that documentary where it came out. <laughs> so, on that note, um, Nasser, is been, you've been part of my life. And then I, I, I met um, Asia and Uni later. You're, you're family to me, as you know. Um, I've known you now for what? 
44 years, makes me feel very old. Uh, we can't even when we met each other. Uh, we're probably going to meet, we are going to meet friends and brothers and sisters uh, to, the, to the rest of our lives. And I do hope that for the rest of our lives, we continue to give back. As I said in your house, when someone said to me, continue sacrificing, I said that we are not sacrificing. This country has done everything for us. It gave us an education. It gave us opportunities to earn. It gave us opportunities to serve. 